Welcome to tutorial video on Twine 2.6. In this video, we're going to discuss introducing HTML and selectors. So as we've seen, when we work with Sugarcube, we can work with different special symbols to create text styling. We've previously seen how we can do emphasis, strong emphasis, and a number of other things. We've also seen how we can use macros to create links and interactivity and a number of other things with those as well. However, there's something else that Sugarcube allows us to do, and that is work with hypertext markup language. Now, the reason why it allows us to do this is because Sugarcube is based on Twine, which is itself based on HTML, hypertext markup language. This means we can use elements within HTML and attributes within those elements to affect how we present and understand how we author interactive stories within Sugarcube. Now, I've covered two concepts here as part of HTML that I want to emphasize as part of this video. They are elements, which are the smallest units within the language of HTML, hypertext markup language, and attributes, which are the data within those elements. So we can divide up a web page, or as the technical term is a document into different smaller parts. Those smaller parts are elements which affect things like organization as well as presentation depending on what element it is. They can also contain data called attributes. So let's look at some simple elements and kind of understand how we can use those within interactive stories and then we will build on this concept in future videos looking at how HTML can be an incredibly powerful tool in our increasingly large toolbox of things Sugarcube allows us to include within interactive stories within Twine. So let's start by thinking about elements. There are generally two types of elements, what are called inline elements and what are called blocking or block level elements. Inline elements don't create any extra space, and they usually have some type of effect. Not all of them, but generally have some type of effect, as we'll see here in just a moment. Blocking or block level elements have an increased effect. That is, they have some type of spacing to them. They are blocks or sections visually on a document or within a web page. So we're going to start with inline elements that you sometimes often produce some type of visual effect, and then we'll look at blocking elements, which help us to better organize content. And those will become particularly important as we move forward. So we're starting with inline, and then we'll move over to blocking or block level elements. So what are inline elements? Inline elements, as the name slightly implies, go inline. That is, they don't do anything other than kind of affect the text they surround. Now, when we talk about elements, we talk about opening tags and closing tags. And that may sound like a whole lot of complicated terms, but we've already seen examples of that within Sugarcube. Sugarcube mirrors HTML in many ways. In fact, we've already seen the link macro, the if macro, the link prepend, link replace, and link append macros follow the same model. That is, there's a beginning, and there's an end, and then there's stuff in the middle. Stuff in the middle usually is content. And when we think about elements in HTML, they act in a very similar way. There's an opening to them, a closing to them, and then stuff in the middle that is affected by the element. Or if we were talking about sugar cube, would be affected by the macro in the same similar visual pattern. When we're talking about inline elements, we can apply often at styles in the same way we were applying at text styles using special symbols within Sugarcube. Let's look at some examples of that to help us understand how we might sometimes want to use the HTML form of the same thing Sugarcube allows authors to do using special combinations of special symbols. So, for example, if we wanted to give text emphasis, we could use slashes. Use two slashes at the beginning and two slashes at the end. And this would create emphasis within text. We've previously seen that for text styles within Sugarcube. However, we can also, if we want, use the HTML form of the exact same effect. So here is EM for emphasis. Notice it has an opening and it has a, has a close, just like we've seen with other macros within Sugarcube. And this line and this line will be exactly the same. They will both have emphasis one using HTML, the other using special symbols to create the same effect. So let's go ahead and play the story from here. And notice this has emphasis and so does this. They are doing the same thing. But notice one uses HTML, the other uses special symbols. 
Either is completely valid within Sugarcube, and in fact, again, gives us lots of options for the authors to pick things how they prefer to do it. So let's return and think about that. We've looked at emphasis, now let's look at strong emphasis. So emphasis, emphasis, strong emphasis, again, two single quotation marks on either side, and then notice the word strong in this case. Now, when we looked at the emphasis, the EM element within HTML, it was EM for strong emphasis. It's the word strong. Notice as well that we're only using a single less than and single greater than sign around the keywords. In macros in SugarCube, we use two for each. In HTML, we only use one. So we have emphasis, emphasis, strong emphasis, and as we might imagine, strong emphasis. So if we go ahead and play from here, or start story from here, that is, we will see the exact same thing. So we can use inline elements, and there are a large number of them within HTML, to often achieve the same effect that we would use using special symbols within SugarCube. So we can do emphasis, strong emphasis, and a number of other things. Some things that there aren't even symbols for within SugarCube itself. So that's all well and good, and we can kind of look through various documents online to find HTML we may like and style things in particular ways. Let's step back for a second and talk about the other type of elements. So I started talking about inline, which again, often use some type of special presentation. We looked at emphasis, strong emphasis. There are a number of other HTML elements that do similar things. Often though, we want to organize things within passages. Now, we've previously seen how we can use multiple macros in connection with each other, and sometimes we have to worry about white space and other issues. So to help with that, we can use HTML to organize things, and for that, we turn for the other type of elements. So inline, often things like emphasis, strong emphasis, and for blocking, or what's called block level elements, we can organize things into kind of a logical or organized sections within a passage. One of the most common ways to do that is with the paragraph element. And in fact, you've probably seen it online if you've worked with code at all, and that is the letter P. So the paragraph element is a blocking or block level element. Now the difference between inline elements and the blocking elements is that blocking elements can contain inline elements, but inline elements should not contain blocking elements. Now the words should not just means this is a good practice to follow to prevent confusion. In web browsers, they will often let you get away with a number of things you definitely should not do, and it will try its best to keep up with you. However, in general practice, we should move from blocking into inline elements. Inline elements should be inside of blocking elements. Pretty commonly what we'll see is the use of something right here, like this example, where I have a paragraph element and then inside of it have examples of inline elements. So this section right here will be a paragraph and will be separated visually when created by the web browser. And we'll look at an example here in just a moment. This will be a second paragraph right here. So notice inside this first paragraph I have emphasis and stronger emphasis. Again, inline HTML, HTML elements inside blocking or block level elements. So let's go ahead and play this so we can see what this looks like. And I will move the start over to example three. So starting the story over here, notice we have a paragraph up here and a paragraph down here. Notice we have what appears to be a bunch of white space between them. This is not an accident. This is incredibly intentional. This is part of how a browser understands blocking or block level elements in relation to each other. And this is a great example of how the paragraph element in particular is presented to readers in a particular way. So we had one line that was a paragraph and then immediately another line that was a paragraph. To a web browser, upon seeing both, they will separate them into blocks or different visual separations. A separation up here and a separation down here. And again, this can be helpful if we want to visually separate things by using HTML to better organize content within a particular passage. Notice in particularly, we have emphasis and strong emphasis again with inline elements inside those blocking or block level elements. Now, having said that, I'm about to break a rule because many languages have exceptions to their own rule. 
And while there are many blocking or block level elements within HTML, there is one in particular we tend to use quite often. And this is known as div, D-I-V, which is an abbreviation for division. So we often want to divide up a much larger document into smaller pieces. Again, we use elements for that purpose. But sometimes we want elements inside elements inside elements. Or in other words, we want a bunch of different divisions of things. Smaller divisions, larger divisions. So we use a particular element, div, D-I-V, for that purpose. Now, the division element is a blocking element. However, unlike the paragraph element, which adds that extra text, the division element it does not. So let's look at a way to do this. Let's move over to example four. Example four, I have a division inside a division, and inside the second division, I have a paragraph which also has an inline element in it. Now, the paragraph elements will create extra space. They will work as blocking or block line elements. The division, despite the fact that it's a blocking or block line element, won't have any extra space. So let's go ahead and move the start over here to example four. Notice right here, the paragraph is separated visually. Again, acting as a paragraph or as a blocking element. Now, the divisions are also block level elements. However, they don't create a visual separation for us. And this is actually incredibly helpful because it allows us again to break things up into parts, a division inside a division inside a division. And in fact, in very complicated web pages, you might find hundreds or potentially thousands of different divisions, sometimes one nestled very deep into the others, sometimes 12 or more layers deep to divide up a page into different sections. However, what they allow us to do is again better organize our content within passages because Sugarcube is based on Twine and Twine is based on HTML. So we can use HTML to help us organize and Sugarcube will react to that. So I told you I was going to introduce this video by talking about HTML and then talking about another concept called selectors. So let me work towards the end of this video by addressing that second concept. So we have elements that have inline or blocking setups. I mentioned that they're elements and attributes, but I've not really discussed attributes very much. So attributes are data within elements. And within a web page, we can store data that affects how we find it and how potentially it's presented to readers within a web page. Now the how to find it is particularly useful for us because Sugarcube understands how to find particular elements. That is, we can better organize our content within passages, as I've showed right here, using divisions, paragraphs, and other potential HTML elements. And then we can use macros in Sugarcube to find those elements and affect them in various ways. And this becomes an even more powerful pattern in Sugarcube to much better organize our content and then again affect it using things. So how do we find those elements? Well, there is a particular web technology that's part of another language I'm not going to cover in this video that's carried over into HTML called selectors. And selectors does kind of what its names imply. It allows us to select a particular element from a page. Now, as I mentioned, in some web pages, we might have hundreds or thousands or potentially in more extreme cases, tens of thousands of different elements. So finding them requires understanding how they store data, or in other words, understanding their attributes. So there are two common attributes I'm going to cover in this video, but there are potentially many, many others. Again, HTML markup language is its own language, has its own rules, and it's been around quite a while. So it's lots of other things they can do. But there are two attributes we need to be made aware of because those are the most common we'll see. The first is ID, which is shorthand for identification, and the second is class, which is shorthand for classification. So if we're looking for one particular element, we can give it an ID value or an identification value. This allows us to find one particular element within a page because their identification will be unique within the passage or page or other thing we're looking at. So when we're using ID, that will be unique. The class or classification, on the other hand, will not necessarily be unique. It might be, but that's not really its purpose. A classification of things is potentially a whole bunch of things. We might have a bunch of cats or a bunch of lions or a bunch of dogs and a classification of things. 
However, we would only uniquely have an ID for one in particular, Fido for a dog, Jenny for a cat, and other ideas like that. So ID will be unique, but class should not necessarily be unique unless we really want it to. So when we use these attributes within elements within HTML, we use them as part of the opening tag. We have in fact already seen this exact pattern within SugarCube, which again mimics a lot of things within HTML. So if we want to add an ID to a particular element within HTML, we follow the pattern of ID equals something, and the something needs to be in quotation marks. So this paragraph does not have an ID, but this second paragraph has the ID of special. Now the other thing to be made aware of when we use attributes is they have generally no visual output. So this second paragraph has an ID, but if we were to see it, it doesn't do anything, it has no visual representation. And this is good because it allows web pages to contain lots of data that a reader or user, if we want to talk about web pages, may not actually see. And this is incredibly useful. And in fact, SugarCube and Twine use this to great advantage. For us, this means if we want to find a particular thing that we're using within a passage, we can give it an ID. This element has this ID and we need to find it. So when we're talking about classifications, on the other hand, we use class equals something, again in quotation marks. So ID equals something for ID, class equals something for classification. So identification and classification. Now, where this really comes into usage and is incredibly useful when we work with SugarCube is there are a number of different macros that can use these selectors to find elements and then affect them in various ways. And we're going to look at more in future videos. But to just kind of get our feet wet and to really look at how powerful this can be for us, let's move over to example six. Example six has two paragraph elements, each of which has a class is equal to fill. Again, using classification multiple times is perfectly fine. Identification, again, should be unique. And then I'm using something a little bit interesting. So we've previously seen link prepend, link replace, and link append. What if we use replace? Replace is a number of different macros. Again, we will examine in future videos that affect elements. So I've got what appear to be two empty elements. And then I've got a link macro right here called fill some paragraphs. And then in here, I'm using the replace macro, which is going to find elements and affect them in some way. Because I'm using the replace macro, it will replace whatever's inside that whatever's inside that element with whatever is inside this macro. Now we use that again using selectors. Selectors have a particular format they're written in, again based on another web technology. So if we're interested in finding an ID, an identification, we use the hash. If we're interested in finding classification, we use a period. So this says right here, replace every element that has the classification of fill. Notice the period goes in front of this. So in this case, find anything that has fill, and these two right have it, and then replace it right here with we can use macros to affect HTML using selectors. So let's go ahead and move over to six to close out this video. So notice there's nothing up here but now suddenly there's stuff up there. And we replaced the content of those paragraphs with content we had in the macro. And this is where we start to see how understanding HTML to better organize our content within passages and then using selectors, using attributes within those elements to give it an ID or a class can become incredibly powerful within SugarCube by using the macros designed for those purposes. So as we will see in future videos on the same topic, we can use a number of different macros to affect the elements that are within the same passage. This is an incredibly powerful technique within SugarCube, but to use it, we have to understand both HTML, hypertext markup language, as well as concepts within it. And as we've seen, those are elements and attributes. Elements, again, are inline or blocking, or what's called block level, and there are a large number of them. And as we've seen when we work with attributes, the two most common ones we'll see are ID for identification and class for classification. The ID should be unique, but the class can be unique or not. 
And as we saw in particular in example 6, the class was not unique. Multiple elements used it, which is again perfectly fine. It's a classification, a group potentially of things. And then we can use macros like we see here to work with selectors, which we'll talk more about in a future video, to then select those elements and affect them. And there are a number of different macros we can use this for in Sugarcube 2.36 and Twine 2.6. Thanks for watching.